chapter 3. In verse 8, 1 John, if you're in the gospel of John, you haven't gone far enough. He wrote three letters, too. They're over next to the book of Revelation. And in 1 John chapter 3 is going to be our flagship verse from now till Jesus is done using it. When you read the verse, I believe you'll understand when he'll be done using this verse. 1 John 3, verse 8, towards the end of the verse, it says this, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested. How many know the Son of God wasn't manifested so we could sing, O little town of Bethlehem, or away in a manger? The Son of God was manifested, we underline it, to destroy the works of the evil one. I don't care what's going on with what the Supreme Court legislates. And we don't care what's going on in the world. Because the Lord didn't call us to be thermometers. We don't go up and down with whatever the temperature is. Because how many know if you do, you'll end up being a lukewarm Christian. God called us to be thermostats. That means we set the temperature wherever we are. Are you all getting that? How many are tired of being adjustable to whatever the enemy wants to do in our lives? Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the evil one. Now will you look with me over in the book of Proverbs, and here will be the, the sister verse to what we want to begin sharing tonight. In Proverbs chapter 11, and verse 9. Through knowledge. Let's just pause right there for a minute. We're not talking about head knowledge. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 8, in verse 1, and this is what he said about head knowledge. Head knowledge will just puff you up. This word for knowledge here is the word insight. It can also be rendered know-how. And the best rendering that I could find, because it carries into the New Testament, and I hope you'll write it down, is discernment. How many know the world is full of knowledge? But only through the Holy Spirit can we have discernment. It's one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, the discerning of spirits. He's given it to us so that, first of all, we can discern what is of the flesh and what is demonic. It's been also given to us so we can discern. Will you just write these verses down? Job 24 and verse 6 says, what spirit is being expressed through you? You say, does that apply to us as disciples? Well, it did to James and John. Because when they got word that Samaria wouldn't receive Jesus, they asked the Lord, do you want us to call down lightning out of heaven? They were sons of thunder, not lightning. To destroy Samaria. The Lord said, that's not what the Son of Man's come from, come for. But just before he said that, he said this to James and John. You don't know what spirit you're of. So the discerning of spirits has been given to us, not only that we discern demonic and we discern what is fleshly, because how many know 
there in Galatians chapter 5 are works of the flesh that can deceive us. And you can work forever about trying to cast the spirit out of somebody, but it's not going to do anything if it's a work of the flesh. A work of the flesh has got to be taken to the cross and crucified with Christ. You see all the different works of the evil one? It was for this purpose the Son of Man was manifested. The Holy Spirit also gave us the discerning of spirits so we could do something else. We put so much emphasis on the negative, but he's also been given to us as a gift that will manifest in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit so that we can know when the presence of God is here. We can even judge when there's prophetic words. Did you know that? This morning, there was no doubt in all of our hearts. That's why we received it. There was a powerful prophetic word that came that brought confirmation. An amazing thing that happens when that happens is this. People could be skeptical and go, oh, well, they got together and talked about what they're going to do before church. But what people don't realize, that's the Holy Spirit. And when he's moving, he's a spirit of unity. and He knows how to move and do that. And that's why you can discern whether or not all of a sudden God's spirit is present. There was an angel of the Lord prior to the Holy Spirit being given to us. He would come to a pool at Bethesda. And there at the pool of Bethesda, it says that he would stir the waters. And when the waters were stirred, if people had the, 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 the wisdom in the Holy Spirit to know it's time to get in the water, the, stir, the Spirit's stirring up. Now that didn't end at a pool in Jerusalem. Listen, we need to know, I hope we'll become a godly people, that there are times in our services where the Holy Spirit's wanting to move and stir. And if we'll respond during those times with discernment and go, the Holy Spirit's here, and release our faith, great things can happen in our midst. It can also be something that we miss because Jesus looked at an entire city and wept over it. He said, oh, Jerusalem, you missed your hour of visitation. How many don't want Fort Wayne to miss an hour of the Holy Spirit visiting us? And how many, I don't mean this just to get you to respond to me, but if it bears witness in your heart, I'm asking you, how many are starting to feel something deep in your own spirit? God's getting ready to do something. Yes. Do you really? Are you feeling that? Then through knowledge, through this insight, through this know-how, through discernment, not the ungodly, but look at who it says. The righteous will be what? Delivered. Will you just take those two verses and put them someplace? Because until the Lord releases me, kicking off tonight with those of you who've come as a resp response to the letter that I've written, I assume, and hopefully a bunch of you that are just here because you're hungry for the things of God. I'm glad that Carl has come anyway because he opened up his envelope and Cammy, he had your letter and you had Carl's letter. So I'm glad both of you had discernment and figured that out and came anyway. Because every time the Lord gives me strength and it's my assignment to be in the pulpit, from now till we're released, we're going to be speaking on discerning that the righteous will be delivered. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 46 is a verse that a lot of you have heard me use before. In that resurrection chapter, the Apostle Paul said, the natural comes first, then the spiritual. Now we know that has application to the resurrection, but it also has deep meaning spiritually because the Lord himself through parables and in our own understanding, he uses natural things to illustrate spiritual truths. How many have had the Lord do that in your own life? One of the ways the Lord did that, that, you know, today we've been talking about what happened 30 years ago in my life. The injury that happened was a spinal cord injury. That's in the natural. 
But the Lord used that in the supernatural to reveal that you see Christ is the head. And as a result of that injury that took place, there are parts of my body that don't receive messages from the head. And how many know in the body of Christ? That's true not only in the natural of Phil Pano, but it's true in the spiritual. That there are injuries that happen in the body of Christ. And as a result, the head, Christ, can't get messages to those places and their spiritual paralysis. And one of the greatest problems now that I found 30 years later as a result of paralysis is not only the paralysis, but it's atrophy. Those two things go hand in hand. Once the enemy can get us paralyzed with something that he brings into our lives, now spiritual atrophy will set in and we're no longer exercising ourselves to become mature in Christ. Those become strongholds. Strongholds were not written to unbelievers. First Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 10, talking about the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. That's written to the church. To believers, where we allow the enemy to get a toehold, then eventually he gets a foothold, and before long, he's got a stronghold. And then in that stronghold, like every other fortress, a strong man comes to dwell. And the Lord has given us discernment to know how to detect who these strong men are. Now we're going to be talking a lot about that. But let's use a natural first to lay our groundwork for what we're going to be looking at together. Not to gain knowledge to get puffed up, but to gain know-how and insight and discernment to be able to find if there are any strongholds in our lives that we can get delivered from them. How many say, this is what I came for? How many know we need it in the body of Christ? When I say the word diet, what's the first thing that comes to your mind besides some really nasty stuff? When you think of diet, is your first thought lose weight? Some of the people that I've heard that go on diets, they say the first thing they eliminate is carbohydrates. I'm on a low carb diet, which means they're not going to eat any. As an Italian, God forgive them, but they're not going to eat any more pastas. Right there, let you know that's of the devil. <laughs> But one of the other things in the family of carbohydrates is something I hope you'll write down. It's breads. How many know God hates diets? I got scripture to prove it. Would you like to have it? Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous man the Lord will make fat. We used to have a quartet that came called the Prophets. I don't know how many are here that remember the Prophets Quartet. They had a great tenor called Louie. And Louie was in need of a diet. <laughs> and Dad was watching him eat one day after church. And Louie was putting it away. And Louie looked at him after lunch and he said, Louie, you still got to sing tonight. And he looked back and he said, oh, pastor. The tighter the drum, the sweeter the music. <laughs> Did you know that carbohydrates produce a type of energy? That's why breads are a staple in our diet. Because they produce an energy. And what I didn't know till I was looking up about bread is that the energy they produce can be an energy that can either be used immediately or it can be stored for future reference. Now remember, we're looking at something in the natural to apply to the spiritual. 
But in the word, the word diet in the dictionary, let me give you its literal definition, okay? And I wish you'd listen to it and then maybe write it down because we're going to be referring to it. Webster's Dictionary said this, the kinds of food that a person or an animal or a community habitually eats. That's their diet. Some people have a diet as a vegetarian. My daughter Maggie and her husband Ty are both vegans. We look forward to their coming home to cook for them just about as much as we look forward to a root canal. Because <laughs> trying to figure out what's in their diet, what they habitually eat, did you hear what it said? It was not only persons, but animals. Did you know that the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 was given a diet upon the curse? When the Lord cursed the serpent in the Garden of Eden after the fall, he said, now this is going to be what you habitually eat. You'll eat the dust of the earth. That was a spiritual reality because man is formed from the dust of the earth. That's our flesh. And how many know the serpent, Satan, is nourished when we're in the flesh? And when he and the church can make an habitual diet of Christians that are walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit, no wonder he's so strong and been able to do what he's done in churches. No wonder he's been able to let them become seeker friendly. That was the deception that he used to bring outsiders in. And in doing it, he got crosses out of churches. And then he got songs about the blood out of the church. And then he got Bibles out of the churches. And the next thing you know, he got us singing songs we don't even know what we're singing about. You want to know why? Because we would have rather had a diet of the dust to feed the serpent for his habitual diet. But that goes even deeper because how many know all through the word of God, it talks about our habitual diet. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm just going to give these verses to you quickly. Psalm 34, it says in verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 2 says, There are newborn babes talking about newly born again believers, and they desire the pure milk of the word of God. But there also comes a time in our life, in our diet, that we shouldn't just be drinking milk because it says in Hebrews chapter 5 that when you're only having milk and you're not having the meat of the word, then you're not exercising your senses to know good from evil and you're not coming unto maturity. So you're needing somebody to teach you instead of being teachers. So now we start seeing there's bread, but we don't live by bread alone. There's milk. There's the meat. Jesus said in John chapter 6, in verse 51, I am the living bread that's come down out of heaven. And if anyone eats this bread, He'll live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life is in the word. And it's in my flesh. That's why the enemy wants to get us away from a diet of the word. Because if he can get us away from the bread... Now we've lost the energy that we may need in an immediate situation or that is stored in our life for something that may take place. Too many Christians are on a low-carb diet. But that definition said not only individuals, but it says the diet of a community. 
That was the definition, remember, of an animal or a person or a community. And it was there that a few weeks ago, during my Wednesday day of prayer and fasting, that the Lord began to speak to me that I was to move from what we were teaching on Thursday night, Wednesday nights, to being a part of our diet at Imago Day. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 23 says this, and it's not really for you all. This was for me during that day of prayer. But it says, know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. It was on that Wednesday afternoon when I read that verse that I said, Lord, I'm doing my very best to take care of the flock at Imago Day." And I thank you, Lord, that you've given me two sons. I thank you, Lord, that you've sent people in that know how to minister under the anointing. Wasn't that something today that when the service began and Lori began with that song again, you know, you could go to a lot of places where you hear a song that's been sung four or five times in a row and people start going, well, there it goes again. But how many know today it was as fresh as if we were hearing it for the very first time? You want to know why? It's not because of anything other than the anointing on a young lady's life that is saying, Lord, use me. And then how many know when Gordon played, I've heard that song ever since Andre Crouch wrote it, To God Be the Glory. But Gordon, when you played today, brother, Herb Albert had to put his horn down because of the anointing that was flowing. And God has sent people in. I'm grateful that in my disability, the Lord has brought elders and deacons that stand in the gap and help to carry the load. Our little church, think of it, the Lord's going to help us as we move in now to the month of October. will be the end of five years. You all have been feeding this community. We were counting it up somewhere. I don't know how many now. Somewhere over 10,000 meals you all have served. Can we just praise the Lord for what he's allowed us to do? But when I was looking at this verse, I couldn't get out of the conviction that I had. Know the condition of your flock. One translation that I read said this. It wasn't the word condition. It said, know the face of your flock. When I look the word up in the Hebrew, here's what it means. You all know that we've said this before in teaching. In the Hebrew language, nouns are verbs. So they really are beautiful to understand. The noun countenance or face is the verb that which never turns. The Lord intends that we set our face, it says in Isaiah chapter 50, like a flint. But how many know that isn't how our faces are? Now I'm not going to look at anybody. And quit looking at mine. How many know there's some people that are two-faced? Just close your eyes and go, hmm. Can I tell you something else about faces? The scripture is full of telling us about what our face can reflect. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a little lady named Hannah. She went with her husband. She was there at the place of worship. And while she was there at Shiloh, she had been barren. And Eli came and looked at her. And when he saw her, first of all, praying, he thought she was drunk. And he went to rebuke her for coming praying that way. And she said, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm just depressed. I can't have a baby. And when all of a sudden the Lord brought her a promise, it says she left and her countenance no longer had fallen. That same verse is found over in the book of Nehemiah, where it says that Nehemiah who was the cup bearer for the king. He would go in to bear the cup for the king. And one time when he went in, he was now aware that Jerusalem was destroyed. And a spirit of depression came over him. And the king looked up and he said, why is your countenance down? 
How many know you can look at somebody on their countenance and see what's going on? Achan had a countenance. You can read about him in the book of Joshua. When they conquered Jericho, they weren't supposed to take anything as their uh, spoils of the battle. Because they didn't win it. The Lord won the battle. But Achan took some of it. And as a result, they lost the next battle they were to fight. And they didn't understand why they lost the battle. And the Lord said to, to Joshua, line everybody up and let's let the tribes go by. And you'll find out who the guilty one was. I personally believe that when Achan walked by, he had conviction all over him. How many parents have learned how to do something? If you just keep your mouth shut and get a good face, we can catch them every time, can't we? A guilty countenance. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 15 and verse 13. A joyful heart makes a cheerful countenance. Now listen a little further, and I'll bring this around. Numbers chapter 6 and verse 26, listen to Aaron's blessing upon the people. The Lord bless thee. The Lord keep thee. The Lord look upon you with his favor. The scripture literally says, the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Why does it say that? Because over in Proverbs 16, listen to what it says in verse 15. In the light of the king's face is life. There's some of us right here at Imago Day that have learned what it is to praise till we enter a spirit of worship and to worship until the glory of God comes down. For me to, this morning, I didn't even know y'all were here. I swear to you, I don't. Because all of a sudden when we were singing, I worship you, I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you. I became aware of what it was to know what it was for 11 days to not know if I was going to live or die. I knew what it was a little over 12 years ago with my wife to be told Phil has already lived past his life expectancy. Just enjoy the good days and the bad ones help him to get through. And I'm alive. And the reason I live is to worship him. And all of a sudden, you see, we can do that. We can worship him to all of a sudden his glory comes. What's the glory? It's all of a sudden you see the king's face. And you behold his countenance. But you see, the Lord said to me, Proverbs 20, 27, 23. Do you know the condition, the face, the countenance of your flock? I'm hoping, I believe it's happening. I, I believe Brenda, Julie, I know that Peggy and I have been doing this a long time. Can I tell you all something about y'all? Gordon, you've been raised around this all your life too. Do you all know that you all come in here as individuals? But when you once come into this sanctuary, you have ceased being an individual member, but you become now a, a local body of Christ. And whether you know it or not, you all have a spirit of a service. We don't just change because we're having an emotional experience. And we're coveting your prayers that we never get locked into a format. Every Saturday that I'm ministering, Peggy and I will have a conversation. It's not always real spiritual, but eventually I bring her around and she gets saved all over again and we, we get it going the right way. <laughs> But 
we'll end that time by telling the Lord we're giving him now our loaves and fish. It's what we've prepared. But God help us that we never come and that's all we're going to do is what we're locked in to have. And I want you to pray that we'll even go deeper into the things of the Spirit because you see, when you all arrive, sometimes there is heaviness. Sometimes there's joy. Sometimes you can feel the burdens that are here. And if you'll all of a sudden allow yourself to no longer become self-conscious, but do as the chorus says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. And that's when the Holy Spirit all of a sudden can minister. And I found myself saying, Lord, I'm doing my very best to try to come to a service. And if something all of a sudden changes, I'll try to go with what that flow is and be obedient to it. And I want to learn how to do that. And I know there are people praying for me rather than criticizing and, and want to support that we can do that. But in that, the Lord even took me into a deeper place of conviction. And can I tell you what it was? Because he said, you're not feeding them. And when he said that in my home, I really mean it. I was on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know how to teach any more than how I'm teaching. Will you look with me in Psalm 104 and I want to show you what the Lord directed me to. Psalm 104. And I'm very, very aware of the time and I know but will you all grant me just a few more minutes tonight? Because I at least want to lay this foundation with you. Psalm 104. Will you follow along, starting at verse 14? He causes the grass to grow for the cattle. And vegetation for the labor of man, that's for the vegans, so that he may bring forth food from the earth. How many see we're looking at what the Word of God says is there for diet? Do you see it? There's animals and there's individuals, right? Look at verse 15. And wine, which makes the heart glad. A lot of Christians have got stomach problems. <laughs> so that he may make his face glisten with oil. And food is what the New American Standard says, which sustains man's heart. How many have a translation there in verse 15 that says, not bread, or excuse me, food, but bread. Do you see it? We were teasing about wine. We're not talking about the drink that people can have. We're talking spiritually. How many know wine that makes the heart glad is the new wine of the Holy Spirit? The Lord doesn't pour old, excuse me, new wine into old wineskins. There is the oil that makes the face glisten. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But look where it says the bread which sustains man's heart. Do you see that? We underline that portion, bread that sustains the heart. Let me give it to you from a couple other translations that I found. The Berkeley translation says this, bread that refreshes the body. One translation I have at home, the Harrison translation says this, bread that improves your health. It was there that I got stuck and I said, Lord, 
I'm given the word. You said man doesn't live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds from you. And, and we're open to the gifts of the Spirit operating. And Lord, I'm preaching and teaching all that I know to do because you said there's going to be a famine in the land in Amos chapter 8. Not a famine for bread nor a thirsting for water, but for hearing the word of God. And I'm preaching the word of God. And I want you all to know something. It was as real to me as me talking to you right now. The Lord was burning into my heart. You have missed the bread that will bring health to the body of Imago Dei. And when I found that, all of a sudden, that was when the Lord spoke to me and said, that's why people aren't coming to the house of God. Because what they've done is just like what happened in the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, it says there was a famine that was in the land. And as a result of the famine, think of it, the famine was in Bethlehem. That's why it says that Naomi and her husband and their sons, they left because there was a famine in Bethlehem. And it was then the Holy Spirit's conviction became so real to me. That's why I wrote to y'all to come and ask it if you'll receive what I want to say to y'all. Because the Lord said to me, Bethlehem means Bethel, the house of God, is the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means, the house of God, where the house of bread is to be. And in the house of God where there was to be bread, there was a famine and they left and they ended up going all the way to Moab. And the Lord said, that's what the world's doing right now. It's drawing people away and they're getting lost because there isn't the bread in the house of God that needs to be there to sustain them and bring health to the body. The Lord said, the word's being preached. Now listen to me, and I know it may sound critical, and I don't mean it to be, but the Lord said, the word's being preached over television. There's people getting motivational speaking. And they're getting it there, but they can't get it in their house. I've used the television to reach out to the lost. I never intended it to be a place where my people would stay home and be fed. And Bethlehem was a famine. And it was then, and this is where I'll bring this tonight's study, not to a close, but to a comma. We'll pick up here next Sunday morning. Is that right, Anthony? Who preaches next Sunday morning? Next Sunday night, we'll pick up right here. Look at Matthew with me. Chapter 15. Because as real as I'm talking to you all, and if I don't have this credibility, then I never will. But the Lord spoke and said, you haven't been feeding my people this scripture. Matthew chapter 15. Now once you find that, we look over in Mark chapter 7. It's the same story in both gospel accounts that we have to look at to get a comparison for our receiving knowledge, insight, know-how, discernment tonight, that the righteous may be delivered. Are you in Matthew 15? Put a marker or, some, or something there and look over in Mark now chapter 7. I'm going to be reading it from Mark. Starting in verse 24. If you're in Matthew 15, you want to write down verse 22. Here we go. Jesus got up and he went away from there to the region of Tyre. Over in Matthew, it says that, that Jesus went to, sec to seclude himself. You say, why are you drawing attention to that? Because you see, God says in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 15, He's a God that hides Himself. What we're getting ready to move into are only for those that are willing to play hide and seek with God. Jesus withdrew and went to a place called Tyre. This wasn't where the spiritual community was at all. How do we know that? Because he runs smack dab into a Syrophoenician woman, a Greek, who was a Gentile. Are you following along? And after hearing of him, 
Mark chapter 7 verse 25. I know I'm going slow, but get every bit of it. It was after she had heard of him. Faith cometh by what? Hearing. If you read Romans chapter 10 in the original, it doesn't just say faith comes by hearing. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Verse 27, and he was saying to her, we underline this, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good. The word there means proper. It's not proper to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. People didn't come from watching somebody on TV or listening to a CD. It came with me alone in the Holy Spirit in my room. When all of a sudden the Lord said, there's bread, you haven't been feeding my people. And I said, Lord, I've been giving them the bread. And I'm doing the best I know how. And the Lord said, you haven't fed them. And they're malnutrition in the body of Christ. Because they've not had the children's bread. The children receive it first. Don't miss the picture. This Gentile woman is a type of the church. As a type of the church, Jesus didn't refuse it to her, but he said to her before she could receive it, and desiring of it, and hungry for it, and crying out for it, and pleading for the Lord to give it to her. Jesus had to say, wait a minute. The children get it first. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. 1 John 3, 1. That we should be called the children of God. To as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to call themselves the children of God. We are the children of God. We're the church. And Jesus said, it is proper first. Before even the demon possessed receive this bread. That the children receive the children's bread. The righteous receive deliverance. Is this breaking through to any of you with what I'm trying to say in the spirit? And the Lord said in the body of Christ there are people bound by spirits. You say, are we talking about demon possessed? Jesus didn't go to the demon possessed. He gave us the spiritual principle first. He said, first, the children receive the children's bread. And the revelation that came to me through the scripture, something I've never heard preached, was the children's bread is deliverance of the saints. <laughs> Proverbs 11 and verse 6 didn't say the unrighteous, the unsaved, the heathen, or the unbeliever. It said it was the believer, the righteous, that needed the insight and the know-how, the discernment that God's righteous people, his children, could eat the bread of deliverance first. Matter of fact, the word first, if you look at it carefully, he said that they first are filled or satisfied. I'm going to bring this part to a close. 
Do you know that in the body of Christ at Imago Day, and believers that I know, I have known what it is to be one. To be a believer bound. To be a believer in need of deliverance. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm telling you all, it's me. But I'm here to tell you that 30 years ago, that's where I was. I ain't what I'm going to be. I ain't what I want to be. But I ain't what I used to be. And for me, it's taken almost 30 years. But I've known what it is for the face, the condition of the flock, to have people depressed, to know believers that are disillusioned, believers that feel separated in their life. I know believers, righteous people. See, how do you know they're righteous? Because they aren't righteous because of them. They're righteous because of Jesus. Amen. And I still believe it with all of my heart. But as righteous believers, they're tormented. They're bound. And I believe that Jesus came for the purpose to destroy the works of the evil one. And I ain't leaving till the Lord's fulfilled that purpose in Imago Day. And all God's people said, Amen. could we stand together and we'll pick up.